Okay, we're taking a sort of a side <clears throat> trip. I'm still looking for passages unique to Mark in order to establish whether the book of Hebrews is talking back specifically to Mark. And this side trip is just going to involve one of the passages that only Mark and Luke handle. Luke is written earlier than Mark. There are many ways to know that. I've started that already in the synoptics. But here I want to show you the particular technique that Mark uses so that you'll understand how he does what he does. And usually that's hard to show, but here it's real easy to show. You'll notice here, and I'm using the NASB translation because it's very literal, that's the words, these are the words in Mark talking back to Luke. Notice how the how Mark is quoting Luke verbatim. That way the the hearer, the reader of Mark is going to be able to cross reference where in Luke Mark is pointing at by using a direct quote. Because remember in the old days they memorized these things. So they wouldn't have to carry those heavy parchments because in those days the Bible was very heavy to carry. So you memorized it instead. So apparently this particular section is so important that instead of paraphrasing or just using keywords, Mark is quoting it verbatim. Okay, so now the reader of Mark is going to cross index in his head. Oh, that's the end of Luke, what we would call Luke 20. Okay, he's he's gonna cross reference it really by the actual the actual citate the actual words. They didn't have chapters, okay, in ancient times. That's a new invention done by the College of Paris in the eleven hundreds AD, the chapters. Okay, but now notice I want you to see how Mark does his wrapping. Next verse, he sat down opposite the treasury. Okay. Luke doesn't say he sat down opposite. It's he looked up and saw the rich putting in their gifts. Okay. All of this is added by Mark. Wrapping around Luke. Mark is giving you additional information. Okay. And you might say, well, why is that important? At this point, I'm not 100% sure why, but it was important or else he wouldn't be writing it this way. He's, he's, he's giving you more of like a TV version. He's, he's letting you get the sense of the physicality. He sat down. He began observing. In other words, he'd been there for a while. Luke doesn't talk about how long Christ had been there on the right. Okay? Because Luke's big point is to link up this with this because of what he's going to say next. See, the Pharisees devour widows' houses, which Luke quote, quotes verbatim. And then, I mean, which Mark quotes verbatim. And then because that ties directly, Luke dispenses with the, the drama, you know, setting. But Mark puts it in. So Mark has to get this directly from God, okay? Christ sat down opposite the treasury. He began observing how people were putting into them in, in the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. See, all that, by Mark is just summarily, I mean, Luke is just summarily talking about it right there. Mark adds data to let you know that Christ had been sitting there for a long time and that it was, wasn't just one rich guy in front of the poor widow. Okay? It was... A lot of them. See, he's got Luke is just focusing on the gist of it. Widows' houses, poor widow. So in between, he doesn't want to detract from the flow of what he's saying. So it just he just puts that in there, real quick. Mark slows it down, and whenever the Bible slows something down, it means pay attention. So Christ had been sitting there for a while. Many rich people. Okay, it takes at least 10 minutes to be in a line and stick your money into the, in the, into the, the box, the treasury box, 
In this particular case, it was the voluntary offering, not taxes. The word tithes in the Old Testament means taxes. It never means giving to the church. And that's something that most pastors who know their stuff can help you understand. Anybody telling you that you have to tithe for the church, just leave that church immediately. That pastor is, a, is teaching false doctrine. Okay, he's just trying to get your money. So you want to leave him. Okay. So Mark is slowing the dialogue down versus Luke. So Mark is making a bigger point out of this issue than Luke did. Luke is just trying to give you, this is a summary of what happened. All right? So Luke's treatment of this topic is very short. But Mark's treatment of it is very long or longer because he wants you to get a sense of time. Many rich people. So, you know, you're talking about, what, an hour? How many is many? Okay, one, two, three, four, twelve. Maybe at twelve you start to say the word many. Maybe at twenty you start to say the word many. But if you're talking like twelve or twenty people, you're talking at least an hour. The Christ is, was sitting there watching. Okay? All these rich people coming in. And then comes in this poor widow. Put in two small copper coins. That's all Luke said, two small copper coins. But Mark is writing the gospel later, so he's converting that into how much cash in that day? A cent. Now, a cent bought a lot more in ancient times than it does now. I mean, you used to be able to have a whole breakfast even in the 1900s or even at the beginning of the 20th century for a nickel. Okay, I could get a, I remember when I was in the 1950s, I could get a banana split for 25 cents. I could make a phone call for a nickel. I mean, I, I actually remember doing that. I could get popsicles for a nickel. And that's, you know, in my own lifetime. I'm 60. Okay? So a cent used to be able to buy a whole lot more than it does now. Okay? But it's still a small amount of money. All right? So he's adding text to interpret what two small copper coins meant at the time. See, this is what it was worth at the time he was writing. Which means it was worth a lot more at the time that, that she put it in 30 years prior. Okay, now look. On right hand side, Luke, and he said. Left hand side, Mark, calling his disciples to him. See, Mark is stressing the event more than Luke did. So he must be told to do that. Why would he do that? He gives you all this sense of time that stresses it, that slows the, the story down. Because they already know the story. His audience already knows the story. So why is he telling it this way? Because he's stressing it. See, this is how you tell the writing style, the theme, the purpose of a retelling of a story. Like when Shakespeare, when Hamlet is played again and again and again, Every time Hamlet's played, okay, the director, the producer, figure out, okay, what are we going to stress in Hamlet? And what are we going to, you know, kind of skimp on? Because they want the, the telling of the story, the retelling of the story, to be relevant to their audience. And when you're doing that, you have to take into account what your audience is like. And then you're going to tell the same story, but you're going to stress certain different parts of it. So apparently at the time Mark is writing, it was much more important to stress the problem of greed than when Luke was writing it. Because Luke treats this pretty summarily. He's telling the story. And Matthew didn't tell the story at all. So it was relevant to tell. I mean, this, the thing actually happened during, you know, the time Christ was here. Matthew doesn't mention it, but Luke does. So it was more relevant to tell the story in Luke's day, and it was less relevant to tell it in Matthew's day, so much so that Matthew doesn't mention it. So this is new information in Luke. So it was important to put it in there. Okay, and now by the time Mark writes, 10 years later, it's even more important to, to mention it. So look at the difference. Look at the difference on the left-hand side of the text versus the right-hand side. There's more being said. He's slowing down the dialogue, saying that, you know what, he sat there for at least an hour. Okay, 
He's adding text to say at his time that he's writing what that those two copper coins were actually worth. So the value must have changed, okay, versus when Luke wrote. And that makes sense because there would have been a great amount of inflation under Nero. Okay, Nero spent all of the Roman treasury. So that would have produced a lot of inflation in, in the entire area that Rome ruled. And he started taxing people. So that would cause inflation too. Even so, this is what it was worth in Mark's day. Okay, then he says calling his disciples to him. So see here, Christ is making an observation. But Luke leaves out the fact that he also called the disciples to him. So now Mark is stressing that Christ was making a really big deal out of this. Truly I say to you, this poor woman put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. Okay? But Luke's rendition is more Samaritan. Truly I say to you, that part is the same, this poor widow put in more than all. In other words, it's a verbatim quote up to here. Okay? Luke has a habit of doing summary quotes. Okay? Luke doesn't ever... There's a lot of times when Luke just quotes the essential part of what was said. And he leaves out the rest because he expects you to know it already. Okay? I don't know that he's actually doing that here, but he's definitely giving you a summary quote. So what does Mark do? He finishes the sentence. See, this is more than all. The of them is not in, that's not in the actual verse of Luke. Okay, some, the translators stuck that in. This is all Luke actually says. More than all. He doesn't have to say any more. Okay, to get the point across. But again, Mark slows it down. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them. See, he's slowing it down. He's putting in more words to slow it down to give you more time to absorb the import. And now he says the contributors to the treasury. Now what's mat what matters about this is that he has to be saying exactly what Christ really said. Luke is not misquoting Christ. He's just cutting off the quote at the word all. Okay? Put in more than all. Okay, but Luke is citing the full the full quote. He's, he, Christ actually said the rest of this, which Luke just leaves in a, an ellipsis, which is a valid technique of reporting. Okay? Put more than all. Because the, the, the comparison is already here. So it's proper for Luke to just say that, to get the point across. But Mark is filling it out. He's finishing the sentence. You know, because a lot of people think, well, Mark wasn't physically there at the time Christ was physically there. Okay, but he's still getting his information directly from God. And this is one way you know that. He's quoting Christ. So either Mark's gospel is directly from God, or it's bogus. Okay, and it can't be, it can only be one or the other. Okay, well, we know it's directly from God given the things that he's saying and the smartness of it. Okay, I don't need some old church father to tell me Mark's gospel is from God. I can read it myself and know. Which is how everybody's always known Bible books from Genesis forward. Okay, Genesis is written by Moses. Moses then elaborates on Genesis through Deuteronomy. He elaborates on Deuteronomy through Leviticus. He elaborates on both through Numbers. Okay. That's the way the Bible is written. Every next Bible book elaborates on the prior. And it's supposed to fold in new information that, that makes it all fit together flawlessly. And if it fits together flawlessly, that's how you know the new book is from God. That's the only way it can. That's how you know. You don't need a counsel to tell you that it's accepted by some hoary heads who happen to be extremely apostate at the Council of Nicaea. Everybody at the Council of Nicaea was so dumb they, did, they argued over whether God was one or three. And those people spoke Greek natively. I don't know if you can be dumber than that. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 tells you God is three, and so does the entire Old Testament. So, duh. There's no, nothing to argue about. So they were dumber than stumps. I don't need a Council of Nicaea. I got the Bible myself. Okay? So he's adding these words, quoting Christ. So he had to get it from God because he wasn't there at the time. 
calling the disciples to him, all the contributors of the treasure. You see how he's wrapping around the right hand side in blue in Luke 21. Okay? And then he goes on to quote, see? For they out of all their surplus put in the offering. Okay? For they out of all their surplus. And then he truncates the quote with Luke. See? For they out of all their surplus. That's where he cuts it off in the quotation of Luke. He cuts put into the offering. He cuts this out of Luke. He doesn't quote that. He doesn't have to because they already got Luke memorized. And he's stressing the surplus by doing it that way. By cutting out what's in blue on the right, he's stressing surplus because he wants to stress surplus versus poverty. Okay? So this part that's in blue in Luke on the right is not in Mark because that way the poverty versus surplus is closer together. That's a Greek writing style. When you want to stress something, you leave out something that's less germane. Because it's already in the context that they're putting it into the box. Okay? And then he quotes, But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Okay? But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Now notice, see? Put in all she owned, all she had to live on. All she owned is extra text versus what Luke did. Luke truncated that. Luke truncated all she owned. Mark puts it in, which means he's stressing. See, he's taking out into the offering. He's cutting that out from the quote. He's adding words, put in all she owned, not just all she had to live on, because all she had to live on would be your income. All she owned, all of her property. Okay? So he's stressing that. Christ really said all of this. But Luke didn't list all of it. Luke didn't, didn't completely quote Christ. What he did say, Christ really said. Okay? But not all of what he said did Luke quote. And that we do that all the time with quotes on everybody. We pick and you know, take out and put in and you, because you're trying to stress something that's relevant to the point you're making. So he doesn't put in into the offering. That's not in Mark because what he wants to do is focus on the poverty. So that's why put in all she owned, this is an extra phrase in Mark that's not in Luke. To slow it down, to dramatize it, to stress its importance. So this wasn't in Matthew at all. It's in Luke for the first time. So it's relevant because Luke is writing to the Gentiles or, and other reasons. And it's still more relevant at the time Mark writes his gospel. And in fact, so much more relevant that he slows it down and adds words here. You see, this is the wrapping technique in scripture. It's done a lot. And if you're not aware of it, you're going to be stupid like the so-called Q scholars who think that Mark is the original gospel from which everybody else wrote. No, dummies. Do you not know anything about literary style? Do you not know anything about the legal technique called incorporation by reference? Apparently, those Q scholars, somebody ought to just revoke their degrees. They're too dumb to live. They were too dumb to live in the 19th century, and they're too dumb to live now. And you see an example why. This, is, this one short passage shows you how incorporation by reference works and why it's done in order to slow down dialogue or you know pick up more dialogue to make a point. And for, for that, I gotta stop here because my computer's going wacko.